honourable members, uh, and as the House can see very clearly, I have indications that some 84 people wish to speak this afternoon, uh, that there will be a time limit of five minutes initially, and that is likely to become three minutes later, and that honourable members might wish to consider their long speeches uh, in the light of that information. Uh, now, the person I can't see is Deary Brock. Yeah. Madam Deputy Speaker, um, well, can I just say about bloody time? Grave warnings from the IPP, uh, high IPCC have been ignored by too many governments and parliamentarians for far too long. Greenwashing and tinkering have been the order of the day. We've had Prime Ministers saying they'd run the greenest government in history, saying vote blue, get green. We've had government ministers jetting around the globe to summits on how to address climate change. We've had sombre words and much head shaking uh, as hands were wrung and crocodiles were asked for their tears back. And then last week, a 16-year-old girl came here, an extremely impressive 16-year-old girl. But she was fawned over by some people, anxious to have some reflected glory, and suddenly we have people running around trying to look worried about yeah. it. Now, I should clarify, there have always been some voices that have been raised, some voices that have carried warnings in this place, and in others for some time. There have been people who warned these benches, who warned about global warming when it was less than fashionable to do so. Some who were labelled cranks and crackpots, and who picked up those names and carried on because the issue was too important. Those people have sat on government benches and opposition benches, and most will not now be remembered, and that will be okay by them. Uh, I'm very glad the Secretary of State mentioned uh, and paid tribute to Rosanna Cunningham, who is now the Cabinet Secretary for Environment, Climate Change and Land Reform in the Scottish Government. She was one such toiler. She suffered her time here as a member in the 1990s, and she still rants about how hard she found it to get anyone to really listen to what needed done. Not just appear to be listening, not engaging in a listening and engagement exercise, but actually listening, not that she bears a grudge. Yeah. I, I thank the Honourable Member for giving way. Uh, one of the concrete actions that the Government could do to respond to this emergency is to ban fracking throughout yeah, the yeah, UK. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Would the Honourable well Member said. agree? Uh, well, I mean, as you know, uh, as the Honourable Gentleman obviously uh, is probably aware of, the Scottish Government has taken significant action on that very issue, and I would very much like to see that taken across the UK as well. There is no place for fracking uh, anywhere, in my opinion. Um, uh, she is, of course, uh, now at the forefront of delivering on an actual programme to deliver on addressing climate change, an environmental policy that takes into account the needs of people and the need to hand on a working planet to future generations. Now, she'll tell you she wants to do more, to deliver more, to solve all of the problems and solve them now, but she knows, as do many who sit in this chamber, that government policy does not pivot so easily and public attitude changes take time and effort to effect. That means that it needs the extra effort and extra attention that great changes usually need. We have to change the way we live, the way we conduct society, and we have to be aware now that the changes will make life less comfortable. That is just how it is, though, and we should get on with it. Now, this is the one uh, issue that might require us putting away the tools of political point scoring and actually deciding to work together for the survival of the species. We may not agree on the way forward, and we don't have to, but we can do that without losing sight of what it is that we are driving at. Me and the DEFRA secretary, or old Swampy as I like to call him, um, can find ways to work together. Now, I can offer him the benefit of vision that those of us who live in Scotland have of a government working towards some serious and stretching targets to cut greenhouse gas emissions. We can chat about how the Scottish Government has put money into ensuring there are enough charging points for electric vehicles here, here. to allow a target of phasing out petrol and diesel vehicles by 2032, about funding electric buses and ultra-low emission vehicles in the public fleet. Yes. Uh, I th thank her for giving way, and just on that, working together, I'm not sure if she's aware, um, bees apparently were looking at 
uh, allowing onshore wind in Scotland, where the Scottish Government has embraced onshore wind. But yet the Scottish Secretary of State is put in writing to the Bees Department his objection to Scotland getting access to onshore wind, and now the departments are refusing to release that, that correspondence. Is that not disgraceful and the very opposite of working together? I am am indeed aware of of that particular issue, and uh, I I think it's disgraceful. Uh, I I don't know how the uh, uh, Secretary of State has a leg to stand on in that particular issue. Not standing up for school. Um, It needs ambition. It does need ambition. Not personal ambition, but political ambition and the desire to see future generations able to breathe on this planet. We need to challenge an old measure of government success, the measure that says the greatest good a government can do is grow GDP, and start measuring success by how much the government can do to ensure that there is a future, where the sustainability of communities and the environment is a touchstone. Would she just just agree with me that for all the glossy words of the Environment Secretary, what's needed is for the government departments to work together, because she knows that Dalgetty Bay in Scotland is still covered in radioactive particles, and the MOD have dithered and delayed on this. Does she agree that needs to be addressed urgently? It cannot wait until next year, as seems to be getting suggested, and that the message has to go to the government that Scotland isn't Westminster's nuclear dumping ground. I cannot agree with my honourable friend more on that particular issue. It's been three decades since those radioactive element uh, particles were found on Dalgetty Bay <coughs> Beach. And only now is the uh, MOD finally committing itself to a clean-up of those particles. It is an utter disgrace. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and I would like personally to see an environmental audit of all MOD activities uh, on Scottish land and water uh, yeah, yeah. to see what that uncovers. And then, yeah. of course, the MOD paying for the clean-up of yeah, yeah, yeah. those operations. Um, We have to have regard to the warning issued by the Governor of the Bank of England when he said that climate uncertainty was an economic risk, where he said that climate challenges could become challenges in the financial markets. We have to see that and swallow it and move on. We know that action on climate change can be a threat to jobs, but inaction is just a death knell and not just to jobs. Mark Carney also said that there was opportunity in the changes to come and we should embrace that and welcome the possibility of new industries and new jobs arising from new technologies. I thank the Honourable Lady for giving way. Does she agree with me that the real kind of change that we need, the far-reaching kind of change we need, is being brought to, the pressure for that is being brought to bear by the future generations that we are failing by not going far enough? And will she join me in congratulating the pupils of Whitehurst Park Primary and Colwinning, yeah. who have been working very hard to learn more about climate change. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I certainly would. Um, I know from my own two daughters, uh, their knowledge of these uh, important issues is so much greater than mine wa- was at, those a- at that age. Um, and the amount of work that's being put in by students right across the UK on this issue is just is phenomenal. Uh, it, it's very impressive indeed. So I really appreciate the Honourable member bringing that up. Yes. I, I thank you for giving way. And uh, like, like me, she spent many weeks on the Agriculture Bill, which, if introduced properly, could take us forward, notwithstanding the implications of our membership of the EU. Is she rather surprised that that bill is yet to come back, months after it left the committee stage? Uh, yep. I, I have to, uh, yes, agree with the Honourable Gentleman on that particular issue. It has surprised me how long it's taken to, uh, to reach the floor of this House again. It was an interesting time. A number of the issues didn't really concern Scotland, of course, as the Honourable Gentleman will be aware. Um, but there were some big issues in that that I don't think were properly addressed by the Minister at the time. So it might be that they're simply grappling with the issues around food production, for example, which, as we know, wasn't even on the face of the bill. Um, the, returning to um, the issues around welcoming new industries and new jobs uh, arising from new technology, that is really why the government should be reversing decisions it made to pull funding from renewables to cut subsidies and deny researchers 
the tools they need to progress those new technologies. Nova Innovation, headquartered a few hundred metres from my constituency office in Edinburgh, North and Leith, has recently installed tidal arrays off Shetland, gathering power from the sea and demonstrating that the technology can be scaled up and adapted to provide a constant and consistent source of renewable energy. That was only possible because EU funding was available to drive the development of the technology. Post-Brexit, there won't be any of that funding available. So can I ask the government how it will be stepping up to the plate? Will it be filling this hole left by our departure from the EU? Indeed, since this is a Labour motion today, can I ask the opposition front bench to give some concrete assurances that if they ever got into power, research into renewables would see increased support and funding. Yeah. Here, here. And crucially, as the uh, Honourable Member for Nahilin and Nair uh, re referenced, the connections to the grid would be cheaper for renewable power Honourable generators. Honourable, yes. Honourable Lady, for giving which is making a valuable contrib contribution. On the point about research and development in Europe, the government won't guarantee replacing that money beyond 2020. Now, that's a very important point. If the government's really serious about doing something about climatic change, they would step up the mark and tell us exactly what's going to happen after 2020. I mean, just another example, the, right honourable, the honourable gentleman is correct, and, and just another example of, of the uncertainty that this whole situation around Brexit has caused, and the government refuses to clarify for the many people who are uh, waiting to see what those grants might be. Um, changing what... So what, offers are, um, yeah, so what offers are likely to be made by any potential UK government to address the causes of climate change and climate chaos in the next couple of years? Changing Prime Minister might offer uh, a, an opportunity to change direction, but I see few signs that anyone actually leading on policy development in either of the two largest parties in here have really heard any of the warnings. Changing our society will require some discomfort uh, some pain, some realignment of how we live, and it is unlikely to be un happening immediately. We still depend on fossil-powered vehicles to get our food to the shops, for example, and often even to get it to our front doors, truck to ship to truck to home delivery van. We still depend on hydrocarbons to make fertilisers. We still have an addiction to plastic that defies all understanding and a hankering for personal transport. People changing their cotton buds and refusing straws in pub really just isn't enough. The average inhabitant of these islands will join in with efforts to change the way we live, happily or otherwise, but it really needs leadership from government, proper investment in reliable, renewable energy production, investment and subsidies for low emission public transport, a real push against plastics, an uptick in building standards, as has been mentioned, for insulation, and energy efficient heating and lighting, and Honourable not just wife, for houses. Yes. Very grateful to lady you And I agree with uh, everything she's saying. But she, could, she ex could she tell the House and could she share her thoughts about how we manage the uh, oil and gas industry in the UK over the next two or three decades? Yeah, absolutely. Well, I would suggest something uh, along the lines of the Scottish Government's Transition Training Fund, which was £12 million. It was launched in 2016 by the by the government, uh, enabling the people currently in the oil and gas industry, because of course there are something like 240,000 jobs across the UK dependent on that, uh, enabling them to look at where they could train uh, and perhaps uh, progress into the renewables industries. That's certainly something that I would very much Further like to point. see. Yes. Further to that point, the, the Shagri oil and gas industry could also be supported by implementing CCS, which actually allows that low carbon yeah, yeah, yeah. transition. And that's where the UK government is sadly lacking, having yep. pulled the £1 billion funding previously. Yep, yep. That's yep. where we need to go, and that can make Stand use of the David. decommissioned uh, oil fields as well Stand going forward. Yeah, absolutely, and I think it's actually a, a, crucial, uh, a, a crucial element that. Um, unfortunately, the two competitions around that were cancelled at a cost of some £140 million, I think, the National yeah. Order Office told us. Uh, and really, it needs to be looked at properly again. At the moment, I think there's something like a £20 million um, prize, uh, uh, prize uh, fund uh, looking at this issue at the moment, but it is simply not sufficient. Um, but this requires a change of government, not a change of personnel. There's no point to changing the hand on the rudder if the course is still towards the rocks. 
but a change in attitude, in ambition, in direction of travel. And it requires change, and this was mentioned previously as well, this requires change across every government department and every ministerial portfolio. It actually needs government to engage with the people and with civic society and to drive this agenda forward. In spite of the pithy words often chanted in here about saving the planet, there hasn't been much evidence of action. This is one small corner of the world and it cannot change global politics on its own, no matter what strange dreams Brexiters have. But we have a duty, a moral obligation to do our bit to keep this world something fit to hand on to the next generation. And it is about time we bucked up our ideas. Yeah. 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 Yeah.